And so as part of that, we started this little experiment at Game Plan. And we said, what does creativity and collaboration and humanity look like at scale um, at a city level? And so we, party, we partnered with the city of Chandler to start to say, what does it look like if you allow um, people to be free thinkers, to be collaborators, and to try to move the community that they live in <coughs> forward in meaningful ways? Right? And I won't get too much into game plan because that's not the point for today, but part of that is we realized that it was equal parts chaos, equal parts creativity, equal parts collaboration, and kind of an output of that started to become innovation. We realized that you kind of have to have a little bit of fun surrounded in that, you have to have a little bit of excellence in there. To me, that probably doesn't look too different from um, what you're doing right now today. I mean, chaos is probably a big part of your inspiration. Right? is a big part of what um, makes you tick and makes you be able to have creative expression. Right? That creative expression in a vacuum is probably not really valuable. You probably are eager to share your creations with other people and get feedback and see them interact with it and see them enjoy it. Right? At which point they might say, man, this is really great. How can I buy this? Right? It now starts to become some form of innovation or monetization of that. Um, you probably care about your product in a term of excellence, right? Like, I, I know I have a wife who's a, a crafter and people want to buy her stuff all the time. She's like, I would never, like, I would never sell you this. It's so bad. I was like, honey, <laughs> like, they want to buy it. They actually think it's decent. I know, but it's got this little flaw. Like, right here, I can't figure out how to fix it. Man. I couldn't sell them that. It's like, okay, well, because she it really is, you know, cares about what she's doing and really committed to excellence in it, then it's fun, right? It's a, it, whether it's a little bit of an escape, whether it's a little bit of, uh, you know, fills a void, um, you know, there's some fun in it, right? So, why is that relevant to uh, why you're here today? Is I think we're on the verge, like I said, of a revolution. If we look at that, there's been a pretty significant economic disruption that's happened. Um, and most of you might think that, okay, you know, Derek's probably talking about 2008 when the kind of economy kind of slid and we had housing crisis. Maybe you think I'm talking about, you know, the looming uh, come education loan crisis, right? You know, uh, economic security is kind of not what it used to be. You know, people don't think in baby boomer terms of, you know, I get a job, I work that job for 50 years, I retire from that job, and everything's peaky keen as long as I show up. I'm talking about economic disruption that happens about every century to two centuries, right? And we, we saw this last, the last large disruption that happened was when we went from a largely uh, agritarian society to an industrial society, probably happened late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, if you were to poll in 1810, for example, and ask what people did for a living, 90% of the planet would say that they were in food production. They were farmers of some kind. They were getting sustenance. Okay? If you were to poll in 2010, how many people are in ag aggregatarian positions, you'd be at less than 10% in the United States. Think about that shift, right? An 80% swing in less than 100 years. And so what started to happen is we went into an industrial society. A lot of the folks that were farming said, you know, hey, there's better opportunity, whether it's to go lay railroad tracks, whether it's to go work in an a industrial uh, complex, making vehicles, um, you know, making goods, doing some form of manufacturing, right? And those manufacturing elements allowed us to farm much easier, much cheaper, much quicker, right? What used to take 100 farmers to land up the plot, uh, farm a plot of land, now one farmer could do or two farmers could do with the right machinery, right? We're now starting to see the next step that, uh, as it turns out, a lot of our factories are automated, right? We don't need a thousand manufacturing workers to watch a line. We've got robots and automation and a number of things that, that are displacing uh, much of what was industrial work at one point. Okay. However, we have people that are creating robots, creating machinery, creating those pieces that are replacing that. And so you're now seeing kind of the knowledge economy shift, right? And you're starting to see 
that. And that's what I'm talking about disruption. I think we're only probably 15 years into that disruption in reality. I, I would say in another 50 years, you know, people are going to be having the same talk saying, hey, remember when people used to, you know, work in factories, used to have these jobs, and now, you know, people don't even have to leave their house. They're very wired neural network, and, you know, they just think and stuff creeps out of it, right? It's kind of rad. And we've got institutional disruption, right? Um, meaning, you know, you probably all know somebody who doesn't work in, in a normal building. They, they probably work from home or work from a coffee shop. You know, hours are getting, you know, uh, you know, people, the, the traditional nine to five 